नमस्ते एंड वेलकम टू अनदर एडिशन ऑफ द भारत वार्ता वीकली दिस इज अ वेरी स्पेशल एडिशन वी लुकिंग बैक एट द ईयर 2022 एंड टॉकिंग अबाउट द फ्यू थिंग्स दैट मेड हेडलाइंस यू नो व्हाट ऑक्युपाइड आवर माइंड्स एंड व्हाट डिड वी टॉक अबाउट ऑन ट्विटर सोशल मीडिया एल्सवेयर uh and if you can see the screen i mean you see a special guest on the uh, podcast as well we have ashish chandorkar a friend of the podcast uh, who you've uh, seen and heard many times before ashish of course is an expert on politics policy culture all of the stuff that we talk about uh, recently you would have heard him on the episode uh, where we spoke about twitter so ashish is joining us for a few minutes to give his thoughts uh, and then of course we have nirav as well regular guest on uh, the podcast and uh, an expert on the economy finance and other things uh, related to that uh, so hey welcome uh, welcome ashish welcome nirav uh, great to start this podcast off uh, with you guys hey kari great to be on the podcast awesome ashish uh, i know that you know you have very limited time so we'll start with you what were some of the things that uh, stood out in 2022 and uh, if you could also give your thoughts uh, in terms of how those things uh, will impact 2023 going forward so i think i i mean i've kept the traditional life of bharat vartha of someone <laughs> being on mute uh <laughs> let me let me talk about things which you know stood out from a from a national capacity perspective right firstly we were still recovering from pandemic 2022 was the year when the world was still grappling with at least in pockets there were outbursts of of the virus all over again Uh, in india the main story of course was focus on vaccination which is where currently we have done about what 220 crore vaccine doses so i think that was perhaps a very good let's say a confidence building measure internally in terms of scaling something based on own capabilities both medical health and technology capabilities so the 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 delivery you know the the capacity of the state held very well i think this was a great achievement for the year which incrementally built a lot of confidence in the society to resume normal functioning i would also say that the new age sectors for example space right we saw a lot of action in those sectors coming up uh, it it shows that when there is the, the right policy framework and the indian entrepreneurial mind which when when they when they that meets that framework there could be a lot significant amount of achievements realized internally the fact that we've had a private rocket launch companies are looking at going public there is a lot of i mean in country research and development happening and and space technologies also tend to have a big footprint downstream in terms of other sectors uh, in terms of industries defense several other areas as well so the fact that these technologies can now be developed and rapidly scaled in india uh, i think that's perhaps a good kind of a defining feature from a from an achievements perspective i mean this is more of an emerging trend uh something which was not solidified in 2022 but we started on on that that track this year so that was uh, perhaps a pretty good kind of a statement i would also say that i i guess last year carry we were speaking about startups and unicorns and all of that now this year towards the end of the year there was a bit of a funding winter that that the world saw or i mean the world is still seeing rather but beyond that the fact that the indian companies or or indian business skills are able to attract investment even in a competitive world right because even when i mean you can argue whether about about the valuations and and the cost of capital and all of that but the fact that these companies were still raising capital in a competitive environment competing with other startups of other countries right so in that sense that kind of differentiated the indian capability and the fact that the businesses or or rather the Uh, those with the money could believe in uh, an indian model of execution so i would say i think those were like the key features where the national capacity has stood out in a big way uh, there are of course several other small pockets of achievements uh, but to me those were like the broad trends yeah uh, fantastic and i think this opens up so many other questions that i can ask you regarding this right so vaccines we're seeing what's happening in china right now and in comparison i mean uh somehow i mean we seem to have uh, failed really well right i mean whether you know having a sense of a little bit of a herd immunity in the sense that you know not being very stringent on lockdowns 
or also having uh, indigenous capacity on uh, vaccination, uh, of course, in ensuring, you know, 2 billion plus vaccinations and so on. So when you look at that, right, I mean, and of course, here, it's important to mention that uh, Ashish has a new book upcoming as well, A Viral Storm, where we'll get to learn more about uh, this. And, and of course, I mean, we'll host him on a separate episode regarding that. So when you look at this, Ashish, I mean, what are those three or four things that we really got right with respect to handling COVID? It appears that the balance of the measures which were taken at least in hindsight, seem to have proven right. The nature of the lockdowns, the, the length of the duration of the lockdowns, the, the balance along with domestic capabilities on producing, not just, I mean, vaccines, but also even before that, things like uh, masks, simple, simpler stuff like PPE kits and masks. So the way it was all phased out, right? And then, then it, the way it all came together when, when there was a requirement. So, I mean, of course, we had our ups and downs in terms of some really bad uh, phases of covid but generally speaking, uh, for a country of this size capability and the fact that we are at like two and a half thousand per capita income, I think bringing those combinations together, it seems that the package has worked quite well or quite all right relative to what, what we are seeing around the world. Also, the vaccine seem to have held up. I mean, fingers crossed on that because we currently, we don't know how the most recent wave, which is affecting China and several countries in East Asia. So we don't know how that's going to come and impact India. But so far as it appears that after our vaccination program scaled up, which was around, let's say September, October of 2021, since then things have been fairly stable uh, at that point of time. Right. And in fact, like we, we are recording this episode around a time, which marks a two year anniversary of the, the, the vaccination approval in India, uh, the vaccination process started on in, in mid Jan of 2020, uh, 2021. So I think after the first, let's say, uncertainty of the first few months, and then of course the second wave, uh, which was pretty bad for India. Since then, things have been fairly in control. Even when you compare with other countries, number of deaths, number of uh, pockets of infection have been well controlled. And I think what mattered, Carrie, was that bulk of this was achieved with indigenous capabilities. Of course, I mean our main vaccine was researched elsewhere. It was a, it was like a UK vaccine, basically AstraZeneca and Oxford which then became Covishield. But uh, other than that, uh, the, the contract manufacturing was Indian. The, the rest of the vaccines which were used in the national vaccination program were all Indian. And uh, that they could function well across age groups and, and how the risks were managed across age groups with different combinations of vaccines. I think those decisions have been proven quite quite accurate or quite correct uh, looking, looking in the hindsight. And I think that's a big learning that sometimes there's a tendency to naturally assume that what the world will say will be better than what our experts will say. But I would say that the, the experts which were associated with Indian, uh, scientific community have actually, uh, perhaps been proven as a better judge of some of these things or as good as a judge of some of these things as their counterparts elsewhere in the world. I think that's, that's a significantly uh, important, uh, achievement and a national takeaway from, from this crisis that if something like this happens in future. Uh, there should be a playbook which could be indigenous in nature and we should be able to trust that playbook. Yeah. Just a quick follow-up on vaccines and I know we'll cover more of this in the episode that we do with you regarding the book. But could you also speak a little about, about uh, you know, vaccine maitri and how we kind of use this uh, for, uh, you know, uh, from a geopolitical perspective as well and uh, how that sort of sets a precedent for uh, what we could do going forward? Yeah, that's an interesting question, Carrie. And if you see, if you hear the uh, various speeches that Prime Minister Modi and the External Affairs Minister Dr. Jay Shankar have made in community events around the world, they've highlighted this very, very specifically that India started giving vaccines to other countries pr practically the same day uh, or same same week that we, we started administering it in, in in India. And the book, I mean, uh, the book is titled "Braving a Viral Storm." Uh, India's COVID-19 vaccine story. So that, that kind of talks about this in fair detail uh, in terms of how we did not distinguish between uh, those who we could have, who, who we could have given the vaccines to and the and the Indian citizens to in, in, in the first phase. I mean, of course, as, as the initial phase of, of vaccine, of giving the vaccines gave, you know, that we kind of then hit the second wave of COVID. So of course, then the Indian, Indian requirements got prioritized. But uh, in that sense, it's been a fairly incredible achievement. And if you hear the statements that various global leaders make in different forums, you will see that they have all acknowledged this as a, as a great act of selflessness, right? That in the sense that 
India was able to treat everyone at par and uh, uh, rise above the the narrow considerations which several of those we saw during the covid period and and that's really created a great impression and uh, and a great talking point uh, great acknowledgement of india's approach towards some of these things yeah at a time when uh, economies far greater than us uh, were stockpiling some of these uh, vaccines and resources and what not right the other thing that you brought up brought up was uh, you know all of the startup innovation and uh, you know the developments in space and this is stuff that i'm really passionate about uh, one thing that we got to see over the last year was a greater overlap in terms of industrial policy and startup innovation right whether it was isro actively working with uh, you know these uh, space tech startups like uh, pixel or agnicol uh, and so on um, or you know some of the policies itself right i mean whether it was a national logistics policy you know upi 2.0 etc right i mean everyone is working closely uh, having worked in the government uh, right i mean what does it take to really make this happen across other sectors as well and uh, you know is there such a plan uh, uh, that that you would surmise uh, you know from from whatever limited uh, you know uh, stuff that you can talk about at least no so carry i will not make any forward looking statements but uh, <laughs> uh, looking backward the the fact that the industrial capability and the technology uh, landscape and the policy space all came together and that's a classic example of how countries can develop capabilities which are differentiating in nature in fact if you go back in economic history that's exactly what other governments have done over the years uh, other countries have done over the years right so it's not something which is uh, it's probably a lever which was underutilized uh, for several years in india and that's kind of changing in in several areas or several sectors now where we've understood that the 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 right, the right facilitative environment uh, coupled with access to talent capital the right operating conditions uh, that's good enough for indian talent to create a, a mark in the world both in terms of creating innovation which is very useful locally but also eventually over time will become uh, or can has the potential to scale global markets as well and uh, i think that 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 kind of template has been set well uh, in the last 2 3 years especially after pm modi talked about the whole concept of atmanirbhar bharat in may 2020 uh, soon after the first lockdown ended so uh, yeah i think that, that that's that's something to watch out for and hopefully i mean as i said i won't make any forward looking statements but we hopefully will go from strength to strength from here on yeah awesome i mean uh, that's something that i'm really looking forward to as well the government uh, sort of democratizing problems to a wider base and sort of enabling uh, startup innovation through existing infrastructure with some of the larger organizations and policy and so on and so forth ashish before you sign off you know what are some person or persons of the year for you right you could even pick uh, certain organizations or whatever uh, but uh, you know who stood out for you in 2022 actually let me take a more lighter view here and look at sports uh, i think who stood out for me was virat kohli <laughs> 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 who, who came back from a really lean patch to to do something which is very worthy of his own stature and his own talent and the fact that you can make comebacks like that i mean you know he has been in the middle of so many controversies uh, often for non cricket cricketing reasons as well uh, but then you know that one game uh, against pakistan kind of changed the way people looked look, looked at him right like he was always a hero it's just that there, there were other factors which were kind of playing up in, in terms of the perception uh, i think it's a good story to to look at right like if you keep keep at it keep at your job uh, keep keep working hard uh, hopefully you, you should be able to get over your mental blocks and which is what has seemed to have happened in his case although i mean unfortunately in the last month of the year he did not play very well in the, in some of the series but i i would i i'm hoping it's just an aberration and you know 2023 will be great for him so just purely as a turnaround story i would say kohli was uh, a fairly uh, top of the mind name for me for the last year yeah uh, i think one of the images that stood out for me was that that straight uh, i don't know what you call it drive hook whatever it was to uh six right i mean over uh, long on i mean i think that was fabulous awesome thanks ashish uh, any other parting thoughts to our listeners uh, before you leave no uh, thanks carry for uh, this segment and uh, of course this year you know i'm hope- hoping to talk more about the book uh, which comes to stores uh, in uh, around jan 10th but we can have a more de- a detailed discussion on on that and uh, just hoping that uh, some of the stuff that we have been talking about in the last 2 3 years and what i have been writing and uh, seems to be coming together right in terms of the the the, the positive viewpoint that 230 odd 
bahut bahut episodes have painted in the in the in the in the in the last 3 years or so uh, so i think that seems to be coming much of that seems to be coming together so let's just hope that we are proven right eventually uh, and perhaps we'll have more positive conversations in the years to come absolutely yeah thanks so much ashish uh, always a pleasure talking to you thank you thanks gary all right uh, that was ashish uh, author columnist uh, expert on policy culture a uh, bunch of stuff uh, uh we're over to nirav and abhishek now hey guys uh, i know you guys have been wait- waiting patiently in the wings so weekly number 122 should we talk about sports or should we talk about geopolitics or uh, economics i mean there's just so much to pick from since ashish brought up virat kohli uh, how would we lighten things up with a little bit of sports and then we'll take it towards geopolitics and what not right so fifa how was fifa for you guys did it live up to expectations nirav what do you think was the highlight sure so i think obviously one was messi versus uh, ronaldo the whole debate was going on for a while and now like argentina winning the world cup uh, that's quite a nice hero story you look at like argentina uh, having lost in 2014 finals uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about messi not playing well for argentina versus him playing like focusing more on his club which was for the longest time which was barcelona right and uh, first game also argentina lost to saudi arabia right uh, maybe that which i felt was it is a game at noon time in qatar which the climate kind of suited more the saudis who live there in the middle east and it was kind of like a maybe the argentinian team was a bit rusty but the whole thing i think it's like a hero's journey you go to the depths and uh, then you rise up and as well as like the argentinian team has been like consistent over a period of time they were the finalists in 2014 they won the copa america so they were building up towards it right so that was quite an interesting thing there were a lot of allegations about like why did qatar win the allocation to host the world cup they've not been like a team which has been active football player uh, and qualified for any of the previous tournaments bribery and corruption charges there's a lot of controversy there's a lot of controversy about like hotel accommodation and like excess infrastructure or like construction of the using almost like either bonded labor or very cheap labor which was being exploited to construct the uh, stadiums etc etc but i think the whole conducting of the tournament went off like smoothly right so uh, that was quite a nice thing basically for the viewers it was a very great experience uh, there were a lot of interesting games uh, this was one of the higher scoring world cups uh, since the 32 team world cup has been there this is like the highest scoring ever and uh, I mean, we had six as, goals in the final so <laughs> yeah and six goals in the final right 3 3 the final was very exciting and france was a young team which was, had won the previous world cup and then coming again to the final so it was quite a nice thing it was a very entertaining uh, world cup it has its fair share of upsets like germany being knocked out japan beating germany it had a bit for everyone right and kind of like argentina going from like depths of despair losing to saudi arabia who didn't win any other game and then coming on to like uh, winning the world cup so it has been quite a nice journey it's, it's a very nice fun event to watch right yeah so you spoke about the hero's arc for messi i mean uh, so messi retired after the world cup another champion of the sport uh, has retired roger federer of course uh, perhaps the greatest tennis player uh, at least in my estimation abhishek it was uh, quite an emotional uh, day right yeah i think the Uh, scenes uh, of the lever cup tournament uh, which was his last tournament was quite yeah as you said very emotional to watch and quite uh, incredible right like uh, to see all of uh, federer and his major rivals uh, on the same side for once right and they were uh, and you don't get to see this uh, team aspect too much with uh, some of these top players right like we don't really follow the davis cup all that much and that tournament also has lost a lot of its prestige i think right like many times the top players don't really play the davis cup anymore also like post the leander pace mahesh bhupati era we as fans have probably lost touch with davis cup right because india doesn't really do well anymore uh, in that so to see all of them in a team environment right and uh, you know to see them you know cheering each other up uh, celebrating together uh, you know laughing and eventually crying together was uh, quite something right and as you said uh, this is uh, the end of 
an era basically right like b- between federer nadal and djokovic uh, these three have basically meant an entire generation of tennis right uh, they have hardly let too many other uh, players win grand slams right like uh, you could say 75 80% of the tournaments have, uh, grand slams have been won by these three right uh, in the last 15 20 years and so uh, this is like the beginning of uh, the end of that generation also i guess uh, for people like us who are in our let's say 30s it kind of uh, tells us about our own uh, you know uh, mortality and age right like you see to me it sort of started happening when the kind of players uh, in the in our cricket team that i used to like used to follow right like the Dravid, the Gangulis, the Neil Kumbles, and then finally Sachin. Once they sort of retired, you felt okay. Maybe this is the end of our childhood, right? So, so now uh, this. Uh, so for tennis fans, this this uh, you know changing of the guard and the eventual slowly closing of this generation would also sort of feel the same. Yeah. No, I feel that. I mean, uh, I remember watching a Wimbledon match uh, of Roger Federer's right before my semester exam, right? Brings back some memories for sure. Let's quickly talk about Indian cricket. I mean, uh, of course, not a very good year for Indian cricket, right? I mean, we didn't make it to the T20 semis, uh, uh, the World Cup semis. But but yeah, I mean, it was... Uh, it was uh, it was fairly obvious, right, in terms of batting challenges up the order or not having the ammunition uh, in terms of bowling and so on. Uh, right? Nirav, uh, yeah, where do we go from here? Yeah, so I think I would say like in general, I think India is disappointed in ICC tournaments and especially like in knockout or crunch tournaments, etc. We haven't done that well. Uh, even in this T20 World Cup, right? If you see like uh, games against the top teams, we lost to South Africa. We barely beat Pakistan in like kind of like a last heist kind of a game. And then we lost to England, like we were thrashed by England who went on to win the World Cup, right? So we, out of like the three key games, we only won one, right? So I think India, what we have seen earlier, and uh, if you go back to the Australia Test Series, right? India has a great depth of talent. You have a lot of injuries. You have the next rung and the next rung and the next rung. You know, our C team is probably the best C team any country has. That, if you kept a team, which was like the, you know, not the A team, B team, but the C team, India would be the best. Maybe what has happened is, Probably in the A team, there are a lot of people playing on past reputation instead of current form. And uh, maybe now we need to be more cognizant of this part. We can't just be playing on reputation. I think all these tournaments, especially knockout tournaments, uh, you've got to be on the ball and you've got to choose the best 11 for that day in those conditions. So obviously conditions vary. All of these things are uh, different. So maybe I think that's a big takeaway. And uh, a lot of people have been in their comfort zones right from selectors who don't want to make like a difficult choice or like the team members, senior members, etc. Right. So uh, maybe it's a time to reassess, reevaluate. Also, maybe the whole cricket calendar has become so jam packed that we need better injury management or maybe a rotation policy amongst players because India is one country which has like a massive depth. Right. Before the T20 World Cup, we had an ODI series with South Africa versus South Africa where our B team played and we did well. Right. So I think those are the things where we need to like have like a big bench with uh, players willing and able to step up anytime. And as well as like uh, we need to get people who are like out of form or like, you know, maybe past their best uh, time. Uh, maybe we need to move on from them and give other younger players a chance. Yeah, for sure, I would say. But there was also some controversy in terms of, hey, I mean, these guys are focused more on IPL and not really performing for the national team as such and so on, right? I mean, I think uh, uh, Vasim and Vakar had brought this up uh, in some of the uh, interviews that they did post our uh, World Cup loss, uh, I suppose, right? Uh, Abhishek, any quick comments uh, on that? I mean, I know we've covered this earlier, but uh, just to refresh uh, our uh, memory. Yeah, I mean... Uh, the surprising fact is that the IPL does not seem to be helping the Indian national team play the best style of T20 cricket in international matches or at least in uh, ICC tournaments, right? Like what is happening is we sort of seem to play quite well in uh, bilateral series uh, where the pressure is less 
but come the uh, big tournaments and big matches we are sort of reverting back to a more uh, conservative style of cricket you know teams like england are really exposing us pretty badly there right because they have built a side which is going out there to play aggressively for the entire 20 overs when they are batting right while we are still thinking of you know uh, preserving wickets and setting up a pace to launch in the last five overs or something like that so uh, yeah i think uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of thinking to be done in terms of how we get back to playing better t20 cricket uh, more importantly, we have two things in 2023 to look forward to. Number one is a home ODI World Cup. I am not very confident about uh, the future of ODI cricket itself, right? But it is there as of now, right? And that makes it a huge opportunity for us to win, right? Given the tournament is at home. We won the last home World Cup in 2011, right? And so there's a lot of expectation and pressure that this time we need to win once more it's like uh, 12 years since then the other one is that if we do reasonably well against australia in our home test series then we should be able to qualify for the world test championship final which will also be against australia because they are pretty much qualified and so that's another opportunity to win an icc tournament right if we basically play well uh, against Australia the next year, which we have had a good recent track record against them in the recent past. That's something to look forward to. I think uh, worth mentioning that uh, Rishabh Pant had this horrific accident a few days back. And if we don't have him for the test matches, he'll be a big miss because he's pretty much our best batsman of late in the test format. Yeah, absolutely. I hope he recovers and, uh, you know, gets to play uh, as soon as possible. All right, moving on. Uh, well, what can I say? 2022 was the year of geopolitics, right? I mean, there's just so many things that happened. I mean, it's le just like a big wide platter. Uh, I just run through some of these things, right? Of course, I mean, we had the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, which occupied, uh, you know, most of 2022, I should say, and still ongoing as well. Then we had uh, the unfortunate situation in uh, Sri Lanka, where the, com co the country kind of imploded uh, economically and the president fled. Another neighbor of ours, uh, Pakistan, had uh, some political turmoil as well. Uh, the Prime Minister Imran Khan uh, was replaced by Shabazz Sharif. Uh, under very dubious circumstances and this aside from the massive floods and whatnot that uh, they suffered and in the uk we had queen elizabeth uh, pass away and uh, king charles uh, ascend to the throne and also we had an indian origin prime minister prime minister rishi sunak we'll probably do an episode with uh, the cfoc at some point of time uh, on uh, the new cabinet and stuff. I mean, whenever things are a little more stable there. Yeah, uh, we had uh, uh, China-Taiwan uh, tensions that kind of escalated. Uh, well, we all followed uh, Nancy Pelosi's flight, uh, right? The most tracked flight uh, ever, I suppose, right? Then there were the uh, the CCP elections uh, in China and Xi Jinping uh, again uh, uh, secured a lifetime uh, presidency there. And plenty of other things, right? I mean, uh, I I'm not mentioning, you know, some of the other stuff like... Uh, uh, you know, some of the quad action and whatnot. But Nira, when you look at all of this, you know, what are those one or two sort of world-changing events that stood out for you? Yeah, so I think, see, what has happened is there have been a lot of shocks uh, to the global economic system, right? So 2020, we had COVID shocks and lockdown, and then uh, countries which depended a lot on tourism suffered. Then you had huge amount of stimulus given in the West, which has led to global inflation. So then the West is uh, increasing interest rates a lot. So that is another shock. Then now Russia, Ukraine war and sanctions have been hit on Russia. But maybe Europe, Western Europe didn't realize that uh, uh, this would affect them more than it has actually affected Russia, right? So there have been like, I would say like energy shock. You can say like a cost of borrowing shock uh, because of COVID lockdown, supply chains or like income from tourism, those kind of shocks. So when multiple shocks uh, hit to the system, and now it tells you uh, which countries have been more fragile and which countries have been more resilient and which countries have actually been opportunistic and used this chaos for their benefit, right? So I think uh, you look at like we mentioned, we started off with like Russia and Ukraine war. Uh, any war is bad, right? Any war is bad. 
it's very sad for the civilian lives lost both in russia and ukraine but you look at what the west has done is that they were too reliant uh, too dependent on a monopoly supplying them energy right so uh, you you've seen like germany netherlands getting slowly deindustrialized because they have had to subsidize gas for the consumers which means that gas power for industry has become very much more expensive which makes like companies like bmw or mercedes or like fertilizer manufacturers like basf uh, having to say it's worth shutting down rather than buying natural gas at these prices it's better to shut down the factory here maybe move the factory where demand is so either move a factory to the us or move a factory to china so this is been like where one kind of shock has hit a closer home you mentioned like sri lanka sri lanka has had like we've spoken about it earlier but it has had a lot of hits together tourism one of the main foreign exchange earners stopped due to covid uh, they did self inflicted wound of uh, having right intentions or like noble intentions if anything but uh, going all organic and stopping fertilize use of fertilizer and pesticides which half their crop yields so road to hell is paved with good intentions so they have to import food instead of being food surplus and also very dependent on foreign borrowing so when things go bad uh, they need to repay those loans and now the interest rates have gone up so all these three things hit them very hard right plus that they've been mismanaged other things all came to roost but this shows that the country was very fragile you've seen climate change uh, hit pakistan hard but again this is where we need to see uh, as we are seeing global climate change uh, more fragile nations maybe the island nations maldives or in the pacific those will be affected so what are countries preparing for how can you deal with it can you deal with shocks india has also had things like tsunamis and earthquakes etc right and though it was not as bad as what had happened in pakistan but this is where state capacity comes into play right that how well can you deal with shocks and lastly i would like to say i am very proud here india has been very opportunistic when russian oil was banned and when russian gas was banned what has india done india said been opportunistic instead of importing oil from the middle east india's biggest imports of oil were from uae saudi and iraq earlier right india imported russian oil about 25% from almost nothing and indian refineries have been refining crude oil making diesel which was surplus and exporting it to europe right so in this kind of like a chaotic environment india also has its hands tied india cannot impose sanctions on russia we are dependent on russia for our arms which has made us realize that we need to be as i would say atmanirbhar for our defense purposes we all need to be sure that we are not held by any one uh, person or any one counterparty for uh, kind of shock so i think that is also like uh, another thing which came out right and uh, now like uh, one other country we spoken about uk right so uk has been through like a lot of turmoil so we've had prime ministers we had boris johnson after that we had liz truss and we have now we have rishi sunak right if you had three prime ministers we've had uh, four finance minister equivalent what they call chancellor of the exchequer which was earlier rishi sunak Nadeem Zawi under Boris Johnson, uh, Kwasi Kwarteng under Liz Truss, and now Jeremy Hunt. Right? We've had like a very ambitious, and you would call like a budget which was not on reality but uh, betting on hope, uh, which was kind of like poo-pooed. So uh, the markets reacted sharply to it, and you had like a big sell-off in uh, UK government debt, uh, all UK assets, and weakened pound weakened by twenty percent, and then quickly these things were reversed. you had like that triggered a pension crisis etc and then this was also a good thing about power of market so now i want to say yes you felt uk was fragile but unlike a country and i would give examples of like uh, countries which are ruled by a dictator or a countries which are uh, no feedback loop from either markets or from democratic means right bad ideas can persist for too long and n- with no disrespect to listras or quasi quarte but maybe their ideas were inappropriate at this point of time and it was very in just 42 days uh, these ideas were rejected the prime minister had to step down the finance minister had to step down and we got a new government within the same party right so this at least tells you that there is a feedback loop and this is what builds resilience it's not about you have to have all the best ideas at the right time etc it's also about how you course correct so that was a positive now exact opposite i would like to say like say country like china which held on to zero covid for a long long time where the feedback loop of markets does exist 
but the feedback loop of the government or the people has been like slightly weaker. But then we saw protests, they took it and now they've ripped off the bandaid and they've like completely gone to zero COVID, right? So maybe they have a slower feedback loop. Uh, these things could have been done maybe in a phased manner about a year ago. They've done it now. So this also tells you about uh, in geopolitics about how people react. And like lastly, uh, you mentioned about say Taiwan. And uh, I think that is what is boiling up. And now if you see, maybe it's not so much geopolitics, but maybe geoeconomics is all countries have realized. So you are dependent of, you are too dependent on Russia for your energy supplies. You are too dependent on China for manufactured goods supplies. If suppose if there is risk of war between China and Taiwan, which escalates to war between China and the U S your supply chains could be cut off. So how do you de-risk from that? A lot of manufacturing, which is there done in China, the consumption happens in Europe and the U S a lot of the companies which are invested there for exports, they utilize cheap Chinese labor, cheap Chinese energy, and you would call arbitrage on like labor regulations, as well as maybe environmental regulations, uh, which allowed them to, you know, lighter regulation allowed them to do things cheaper. And that is how companies have made a lot of profit. But are they too reliant on like one government, one location? So in COVID, you saw maybe the location can be shut down or in in times of like, say, uh, potential geopolitical stress, can all your investments be locked in the country and the capital can't be removed? So this has seen like a lot of people going from like just in time manufacturing to like just in case. Uh, Your big winners have been like India, Vietnam and Mexico, maybe Indonesia as well, right? So that's also like another thing where uh, we are seeing it play out slowly. Apple has said they want to move about 25% of iPhone production to India. We started assembling. Hopefully we do more. Hopefully we make our own semiconductors. Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing company TSMC has decided to de-risk by setting up plants in Arizona in the US under the CHIPS Act where they're getting some subsidies. You're seeing Foxconn setting up plants in India and in Vietnam for, so I think MacBooks, AirPods and Apple Watches are being made in Vietnam. iPhones are being made in India. And also Foxconn is making like a MacBook and a iMac assembly plant in uh, the US as well. So I think people are kind of like uh, spreading their bets, diversifying their risks, right? And that is one big learning through this period, right? Basically it is, how can you deal with shocks? Do you have enough shock absorbers? Do you have a plan B or a plan C, right? I think that is one big learning. Uh, and it shows that if you are too fragile, you are too indebted to foreigners, you are too dependent on one energy supplier, you are too uh, dependent on one place for like some critical goods. Could be even vaccines earlier, which has happened. Uh, you could be for some pharma goods, etc. You can be vulnerable to sanctions from others as well, right? So I think this is one of the big uh, takeaways from like this year. Yeah, fantastic uh, summary, Nirav. And of course, I mean, we've covered plenty of this stuff uh, in the Velina stock series, right? I mean, where we've had various very diverse guests uh, talk about all these aspects on geopolitics and stuff, uh, whether it is energy or Australia, US, you name it, right? Abhishek, this also 2022 was a sort of a multipolar world, right? I mean, or rather, I mean, it was the first glimpse of how this will look like, right? I mean, whether it's the Quad or the AUKUS and so on and so forth. Uh, right. And India played uh, its odds really, really well, I should say. Right. I mean, recently we assumed the G20 presidency as well uh, with that wonderful slogan, one earth, one family, one future. So how did India fare in terms of geopolitics in 2022, according to you? Yeah. So just before I come to India, I think I would like to summarize what uh, Neera was saying using a term, right, which the economist historian Adam Tooze uses a lot these days. He calls it poly crisis. A prob- so what's a crisis? Crisis is a problem which we are not, we are struggling to cope with. And in poly crisis, what is happening is there are multiple disparate problems and crises that are coming up, but they interact in such a way that the sum of them is worse than their individual effects. Right. So just think about one of the examples we talked about, which is the UK political crisis. Right. So in UK, there was a change of uh, prime minister. Liz Truss comes in and she goes for a very strict sort of right wing orthodox sort of tax cuts and all that kind of a policy. Right. The markets totally react in a very sort of 
drastic manner, right? Which brings down their government. But why did the market sort of suddenly react uh, to tax cuts and things like that? That is because there was already a huge energy subsidy bill that was already factored in, right? And why did that happen? Right? That happened because of the Ukraine crisis. So you can see, right, all these things, one after the other, there's like a domino effect happening. So coming to India, right, the biggest talking point, if you leave aside the either the niceties or the, what I would say, India's PR problem today, right, in terms of foreign media where this constant talk about, uh, you know, democracy in decline in India and all that. So I would say let's leave aside both that topic as well as uh, the sort of feel good uh, acronym kind of things that are happening, right? Like the Quad and G20 and all these kind of multilateral events. The biggest talking point about India has been its policy with regards to Russia, right? Now, of course, you could say that our national interest is not best served by, you know, uh, looking at short term economic numbers and it's better to be, you know, totally in line with uh, the US or the West. But that's a, you know, sort of call that India took uh, because, you know, we believe that we are important enough for the West uh, in terms of as being a counterweight, right, to China. Right. And we are probably the only country in the world which is actually going, you know, toe to toe with Chinese soldiers on our borders. Right. Like no one else. So you cannot really lecture us uh, on that point. Right. We are paying for our own security with our own blood. Right. So that itself makes India an integral part that, you know, it, they cannot make uh, India a pariah state right now. Right. Based on our actions on Russia and so with on the balance India took these decisions right to not totally outrightly condemn Russia and you know take our economic and national interests on the forefront the next few years is a big opportunity for India especially on the manufacturing side right in terms of to see if we can build more capacity have more of these uh, global corporations uh, or even our domestic players setting up more, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing facilities, especially for uh, things which add value globally, right, which could be export generating and so on. And so uh, that's something to watch out for. I think one thing we have talked a lot about is the PLI schemes and probably it would make sense if, I mean, in terms of policy for policy makers that we get a sort of good and better report cards in terms of how are things going, right? Because in on one hand, uh, while there is a general sense of uh, sort of optimism around those PLI schemes, but I also see the opposition slowly sort of trying to build a narrative that, you know, PLI is also a bit of crony capitalism and you know picking of winners and losers and all that right especially with people like Raghuram Rajan being quite uh, vocal in criticizing it so I think it would make sense for the government and others to also sort of publish uh, more uh, useful report cards right at periodic intervals in terms of how successful these schemes are and if not what are the kind of pivots we are doing right to shift from sector to sector so yeah that's something to look forward to in 2023 yeah let's uh, stick with the economy nirav how would you summarize the indian economy at this point of time i mean you know relative to other economies and here i'm not talking about our immediate neighbors uh, pakistan or sri lanka but you know even when you compare with world economies uh, i think we have done relatively better in 2022 uh, right, we overtook uh, UK to be the fifth largest economy in the world, and uh, our billionaires are kind of competing with each other in terms of uh, you, you know when we'll be 30 trillion or 40 trillion. Right, Adani says we'll be 30 tri trillion by 2050. Mr. Ambani says uh, we'll be 40 trillion by uh, 2047, and so on. Uh, so clearly, there's a lot of optimism. 
uh, for the long term uh, as such. But, uh, you know, going into a recession, right, uh, as we expect this year, how is India sort of positioned to, you know, take some of these chances and uh, and do well as uh, as an economy? Sure. So I think, see, you have to go back a bit. So I think India did like a few good things where we didn't try and ape the West and we did not let like, you know, perfect be enemy of good. So, for example, like the West, when they had COVID, and st- they gave like a massive stimulus. And this has led to like huge inflation. Actually, India has seen this play out before. India went on a big spending spree after the 2008 financial crisis. And we gave a lot of handouts in the form of Narega. Some of it was required, but probably was overdone by a large amount. So, we had known that this is all leading to like a huge amount of inflation. And not all the spending is productive. So, I think when the whole economy was shut down... It was no sense in trying to stimulate the economy. Only once when we opened up, we've kind of like given piecemeal uh, stimulus in areas wherever it is required. So I think that has been like a big win, right? We've not let blindly followed whatever the West is doing. That is what we should be doing, which at that time, uh, a lot of commentators and like Western economists are saying what India should be doing. India thought what is right for itself. So that is very important. Two is India has been very resilient. It's not very dependent on foreign capital, like not for government debt or not for corporate debt. So that has been good. Uh, there's been a little bit of investment in the equity markets, which foreigners pulled out a lot. But we've seen like a lot of domestic savings being channelized into the equity market. So that has seen something which is pretty positive as well. Even in terms of like our startup investments. So when there was a lot of loose money, easy money, zero interest rates, India was a bright spot for growth where a lot of investments were made. See, some of the startups which do not have a sound business plan, which were uh, betting too much on exponential growth too far out in the future and i would say like they were hope plays you know hoping something plays out it's like buying way out of the money kind of option you know lottery tickets those might fail but there are a lot of genuine businesses as well uh, they got funded they've generated employment so that has been like a very big positive and it's been a virtuous cycle right and uh, lastly i like we've spoken a lot bharat Varta has had episodes on like semiconductors it has had on like pli schemes but the good part about the PLI scheme, it is production linked incentives. So one is a lot of incentives are on like tax breaks. So now tax breaks in a lot of businesses, you're not manufacturing anything at all. So there's no tax collected there. So even if you give a tax break for a while and then we start, then we will collect taxes in the future. People who get employed will pay income taxes. They who are employed will consume and there's a big multiplier effect, right? So that is one very good thing. Uh, we've seen taken some of the points from East Asian economies and uh, that is how we've chosen to do. Then lastly, what I want to say is India has had this very big Achilles heel is import dependence on energy. That has been like our sore point. Whenever oil prices goes up, India is vulnerable to much higher oil prices. We import almost all of our energy requirements. We've been very pragmatic. So we've not said, oh, we should shut down coal like what Europe has done. What we've done is in parallel, you have a big push to wind and solar that capacity is being added in the background without making too much noise. And there are incentives in place for that, right? So that is good. Uh, We've been very opportunistic where we could get cheaper Russian oil at a discount. We've done that, right? We were very sensible. We raised the fuel taxes when oil prices collapsed globally. And now when the oil prices rose a lot, then we've cut the fuel taxes. We've kind of managed inflation a bit in that way. All of these things. I think India has been like very pragmatic, looking very path dependent. We've developed a lot of state capacity. We saw that in vaccination as well. So I think we are getting better. Uh, Lastly, we've spent a lot. The money has been spent, I would say, at the margin. At the margin, instead of handouts, etc. It's been spent on giving food to the real bottom of the society, right? Free food, which is probably necessary when people are out of jobs. So that kind of created, nobody died of hunger, right? That was very important. And uh, second thing is we've spent a lot on infrastructure. When this infrastructure, this spending will have a big multiplier effect in the years to come, right? There are loads of things. There is like Vande Bharat Express. There have been metro projects in like over 20 to 30 cities now. You've had like a lot of highway projects, expressway projects. The most recent one is, I'm from Mumbai. So like uh, Mumbai to Nagpur via Nasik. So I think Nasik to Nagpur has been opened, right? So a lot of those things have happened. So I think all these things, I think on the whole, I feel India is in a better spot if the West goes in a recession, right? India is not too dependent on foreign capital. Maybe some of the startups are, but the ones with valid business models will grow. So that is one. India has kind of found an alternate source of energy or like has hedged its bets, right? So even if the prices might go up, we are secure in terms of like no one 
party can kind of sanction us or stop supplying energy to us right so that is a positive india has been like has more domestic focused economy actually it's a sad thing we don't export much but that is why given that we export in a smaller percentage of our economy we are more resilient to external shocks the recession which is very domestic driven that will hit india harder and this at this time uh, doesn't seem to be the case rbi has done a good job they did not cut rates to zero they kept it at like 4% now when they have raised it they have raised it to like uh, 6.25% right so they have been more balanced they have been more balanced they have been more nuanced and uh, so i think india on the whole is more resilient versus some of the other countries and uh, i think we've got a decent uh, leadership politically within the institutions which is going at things in a path dependent manner so we are not holding on to like big dogmas we are not betting on hope and uh, we take feedback from the markets i think politically we have regular elections uh, maybe too many elections in a year so the leaders get regular feedback on their policies and uh, also the markets are like fairly uh, efficient so that is another form of feedback so yes i think these are positive i think one big highlight about like getting things done was air india privatization right and uh, that is one big thing which has gone through uh, which shows the commitment uh, all these things if you really see frankly uh, or sadly air india was a big loss making entity it was sucking in a lot of money using a lot of resources like very good talented people a lot of money being spent and with like hardly any output coming out right maybe if the tatas run it in a little bit better manner that improves productivity for the whole country not just the consumers of the airlines right so i think a lot of these things there are slow incremental steps each one on its own uh, each one expressway or one metro line or all of that right is not going to change anything massively but put in together everything all of these things put together uh, adds up in a compounding manner so yeah that is i am i'm very bullish on the indian economy we are in a slightly some sort of a sweet spot as well hopefully both ambani and adani are wrong uh, we are recording this in 2023 uh, maybe we grow much faster than even they expect right in their wildest dreams so absolutely i think you know when we talk about india often often times you know we think that it's so large and complex where do you even start with some of these things right but i feel given that circumstance i think small cumulative steps are so important right whether it is a focus on hard infrastructure right building those uh, highways and what not whether it is you know small industrial policy steps uh, whether it's the pli or the subsidies for uh, you know ev so on and so forth i mean these are small things that uh, uh, really will impact uh, big time right and uh, you know we just talked about geopolitics i think forget about uh, china plus one right now i mean people are sort of looking to exclusively at india in some sense right i mean i can talk uh, about uh, startups specifically right i mean with all of the implosion that's happened uh, in the chinese startup ecosystem right a lot of money is definitely going to flow into india right and so i mean the funding winter as such that we saw is just a minor blip and a necessary blip i should say right i mean there was a lot of uh, you know money in the uh, system very suddenly uh and you saw crazy things happen in terms of valuations and uh, expenses and burn rates and what not uh, right so hopefully i mean this period of sanity will sort of realign people uh, in terms of what is really important right business uh, revenue profits and so on to round things off let's talk about some of the political stuff as well uh, we had a bunch of important elections in 2022 as nirav mentioned um we are never short of elections every year right it keeps happening earlier in 2022 we had the up elections where uh, Uh, yogi adityanath uh, ji got elected as the cm uh, then quite recently in uh, november december we had the gujarat elections where the bjp uh, won a record seventh time uh, and, and of course we had uh, haryana elections uh, and so on and so forth aside from that the indian national congress had uh, you know its own party elections uh, where uh, mr malikarjun karge emerged as the uh, party president Uh, of course with the blessings of the gandhi family right and uh, you know aside we got a new president uh, shrimati dropudi murmu uh, and uh, a vice president as well uh, um, shri jagdeep uh, dhankar uh, from abhishek's uh, state that's something that i have to mention abhishek when you look at it politically right what are some themes that emerged from 2022 yeah i think uh, so while uh, we were discussing this latest round of elections maybe a month back uh so what is kind of emerging is that the bjp is uh, not performing 
as well in the state elections and this is like a continuing trend that it doesn't perform as well in state elections as it does in the uh, Lok Sabha elections unless there is a certain X factor at play, right? And that X factor is places where uh, Narendra Modi has a very specific appeal, right? And for example, Gujarat, where from he was the CM for three terms, or you have Uttar Pradesh, where he's the you know MP, right? Uh, but in other states where there is that direct linkage is not there, the BJP is kind of facing a competitive situation, right? Uh, so it narrowly lost in Himachal Pradesh. And I believe it will face uh, uh, sort of tough elections in the next year, whether it is to retain Karnataka or to, you know, gain back Rajasthan and so on, right? Uh, Madhya Pradesh will also be fairly close. Chhattisgarh will be pretty tough for the BJP next year to retain. So these were the bunch of elections in 2018, right before the 2019 election, which the BJP had lost, I think, all of them. And so there was some concern, right, leading up to 2019. But the 2019 elections proved to be pretty different, right, because once again, the Modi factor comes into picture much more in the Lok Sabha elections. So uh, that's where I think the BJP is. They need to probably find out more credible leaders at the state and local level, right? Because where they are able to find out such leadership, they do well. Uh, I think Assam is an excellent example, right? Where Himanta Biswa Sarma's name really uh, carries a lot of weight now at the state level. That's something for the BJP to look at. I think the Congress is trying for yet another reinvention of Mr. Rahul Gandhi's image, right? With his continuing uh, Yatra. I think it has definitely got a lot of people on his side excited, right? That he's sort of uh, been on the road for over a hundred days. Without um, wearing a sweater. Had that. Without wearing a sweater, right? I, I, I don't know, like some of the things sometimes I hear him say, I uh, I kind of worry, wonder whether, you know, these are actually people doing voiceovers and doing a parody or whether he's himself speaking. So I heard him say in one of the clips that, uh, you know, what is this? Like, there is no winter. It's all in your mind, right? The, the, there's no such cold, right? It's all in the mind or something like that. So he's gone at a different, um, uh, let's say, mental plane but uh, jokes apart i think uh, you have to give him credit right i mean it's yeah, uh, he's trying quite a quite a feat of uh, determination and strength to do what he has done right whether that will make for a, a better politician we'll have to wait and see but at least i think uh, there was a interview of yogendra yadav where he was trying to explain that what this Yatra has done is basically end once and for all his Papu image, right? You can't call him a Papu anymore because number one, he's able to survive on his, survive, right? Out in the open. He has now met the people of India, right? Things which you basically associated uh, with him, right? That he's a sort of Delhi elite guy who only you know he's more known for his foreign trips right than meeting the people of india so those are the kind of things they are probably working on for his future image building right so that uh, he becomes a sort of more credible candidate for uh, future elections so that will be something interesting to watch out for the other thing is i guess the Aam Aadmi party is working hard to sort of establish its presence across more number of states. I mean, it is happening without great success right at the moment, right? It didn't really work out well for them in Goa or Gujarat, for example, this year, but they're def definitely making an attempt. And especially in urban pockets, I would say that uh, they will find, or they'll try to find opportunities to grow their party in the next uh, year or so before the 2024 election because ultimately i think 
before the 2024 elections, there'll be a sort of jostling for uh, space and influence in all the opposition parties, right? In terms of who will sort of spearhead the opposition's uh, campaign, right? And parties like the Ahmadmi Party or even the TMC uh, will be sort of uh, trying their best to you know be at the forefront of the opposition right uh, in terms of whether they can for forge an opposition unity or you know whether they will do things post poll is something to watch out for but i do suspect uh Armani party and tmc to be sort of at the forefront of this yeah, and we have a bunch of interesting elections coming up as well. Uh, Karnataka, uh, of course, uh, in April. Uh, then we have uh, later in the year, I think we also have Madhya Pradesh as well, Madhya Pradesh and Telangana as well. Uh, we will have Roj Jaraman, our resident uh, political expert, uh, on the podcast discussing a few of these things. Just add maybe Maharashtra, like Maharashtra politics. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. So <laughs> Fascinating. I think... No, so that was fascinating. So you saw like, it's been like a whole drama that you had, let's say like A and B were in coalition, that is like BJP and Shiv Sena versus NCP and Congress, right? So they are A, B, C, D, the one, two, three, four parties. Suddenly B decides to switch and there's a grand coalition or Maha Vikas Agadi, as they called it, which was formed between like Shiv Sena. So it's like as if you're playing doubles and then one of the partners shifts to the other side and it's three versus one. And uh, after that, there was an attempt made for like a one-day government where some of the rebels from NCP joined with BJP, which kind of fell through. Then you had, after like two and a half years, like two-thirds of Shiv Sena uh, formed another faction led by Eknath Shinde and they've joined BJP. So there's a lot of moving parts. Actually, you think about it this way. Indian media, I think, gives a lot of importance uh, to UP. Yes, UP is the biggest state by population, most number of seats in uh, Lok Sabha, but in comparison, very little is actually spoken about Maharashtra, which is the second biggest state by the number of seats in Lok Sabha. It's third by population. Actually, Bihar is a little bit higher, but uh, seats are based on the old uh, population census. And uh, it is the biggest by GDP, right? And very little attention is being paid here. Also, whatever attention is paid is actually like maybe Mumbai gets a uh, bulk of it due to economy. But rest of Maharashtra is kind of ignored in the national media, right? So I think all of this is uh, quite interesting and keeping the politics aside, right? Having a stable government in the state which provides about uh, 18 to 20% of your GDP, large chunk of uh, GST collections, etc. Having a stable government which is pro-growth, pro-development, etc. Uh, will have a multiplier effect, right? So I think uh, that is a very big positive. There are a lot of infrastructure projects. Uh, there's a lot of heartburn amongst, I would call like my family as Maharashtra resident, even if we are Gujarati speakers, right? But uh, Maharashtra residents about uh, Maharashtra missing out a lot of projects to Gujarat, to Karnataka, to Tamil Nadu, right? And now politically, this is another feedback, right? That if people want something, politicians realize that this is wanted. And now uh, there are redressive steps going on. There's a push to infrastructure. On 26 Jan, two metro lines in Mumbai are being inaugurated, right? So I think that's a nice positive thing. And uh, regardless of whichever side of the spectrum of whatever politics, having a stable government, uh, which can like do policy making and like work for the people without a lot of noise is actually always beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. Well, to wind this uh, rather long and uh, fascinating conversation, let's talk about your person or persons or organization of the year. Abhishek, who stood out for you or rather what organization stood out for you in 2022? So I guess from a global perspective, I guess Putin and Zelensky are the most influential people right now right and i mean if you hear western commentary which is primarily what we hear they would sort of almost uni unanimously say that zelensky is the person of the year but i guess i would put both of them in terms of the global importance right now they have in some ways even president z is uh, almost that important right now right geopolitically from an India perspective, I guess it's pretty hard to say, right? I mean, I would probably put Gautam Adani, right? 
right now in terms of the sort of empire that he is building in so many different lines of business right the sort of importance that his conglomerate is ha- beginning to ha- have on the indian economy i would say that he would be the person of the year but also i would say that you know it's very important that you know he also sort of keeps running his businesses as disciplined a manner as possible right because even i mean we have finally sort of come out of the massive debt fueled crisis that our economy had been you know running right with the banks and their balance sheets being totally stressed out for about a decade right and so we don't want yet another contagion to sort of start off and so i would say that someone like a gautam madani and his uh business is something we very definitely want to succeed right because he has very sizable debt on his balance sheets as well right uh, but right now the indian economy and india's public sector banks are in a healthy state and so it is important you know for the nation that that sort of continues in the next few years as well all right nirav over to you your person of the year i would definitely say elon musk See, like the thing is, he's had the whole battle, like Elon Musk taking over uh, Twitter, Elon Musk with like his uh, Tesla company rocketing up. He became the richest man in the world for a short while. Now he's given it up. Uh, he's had that. He's had two kids uh, born with two different women this year, right? So, uh, so that is something. Two of nine. And if that was right. Two of nine, right? Yeah, two of nine, nine. Yeah, two of nine. And if that wasn't enough, even his dad had a kid. right i think elon has been like in the media in uh, see he's a genius no doubt see nobody becomes richest man in the world nobody can like be a founder or a co-founder of like so many varied companies right right from paypal tesla uh, solar city uh, spacex right and now being like ceo Neuralink. of twitter as well right the way he is so irreverent totally bashing out uh, any older status quo and uh, not being bothered too much about like norms right he's been like what you would call like a flawed genius right he has his he has his flaws no doubt about it but he's very open about them he's he's been open about it he's been very vocal maybe brushed off like a lot of people in a many wrong ways right he fired half the staff of twitter when he said that a lot of them were not adding any value and even with half the staff twitter has like actually functioned completely well in the us uh, twitter was actually live streaming the football world cup in the places where they had access to and we did not see the servers collapse right a lot of people thought that will be the collapse of twitter and so he's shown that he can take tough decisions he follows up with it even if he fired 3700 then hired back some 50 or 100 whatever it was he can take tough decisions and that's what has got him to where he is right so uh, definitely this year has definitely been the year of elon musk yes now maybe tesla shares are falling yes it is still the largest like the most you would say the largest car company by market valuation it is bigger than toyota plus honda plus gm plus ford plus all of those combined right so it is so he's done something very spectacular i think this year he's been he's seen like huge highs some lows and uh, definitely i don't think there's been a week where he's been out of the news right so uh, definitely he's the man of the year yeah i mean you just could not uh, keep him out of the news and and it's such an amazing time that we're living in right i mean you know think about you know maybe even 10 15 20 years back the billionaires uh, the typical billionaires is you know some stuffy guy uh, you know on a yacht you barely ever hear anything uh, non diplomatic from that person right and here is this guy who is just going crazy on you know live tweeting all of his uh, thoughts and what not right which is fantastic i think uh, it's it's such an amazing like a refreshing change uh, irrespective of you know uh, whether you like some of the stuff that he's saying or not uh I think for me my person of the year has to be Dr Jay Shankar right i mean the way he has articulated uh, you know the nation's hopes and aspirations on the international stage and the way he has uh, sort of defined the bharatiya perspective right uh, not being called on by uh, you know all of these uh, international folks whether in terms of uh, actively denouncing russia uh, or uh, you know on the oil imports and so on and so forth right uh, he's held his own and he's held 
helped India hold its own uh, in the international stage on multiple, multiple occasions, uh, right? So, in fact, I mean, I was just watching a clip of his uh, on some Austrian uh, TV show, right, where, um, again, I mean, it's, it's one of those uh, um, uh, Chad Shankar moments, right? I mean, uh, he's... Uh, He's asked a question and, you know, he treats any any question as a nice full toss that he can whack it out of the stadium for a six, right? Amazing, amazing stuff. Uh, so hats off to you, sir. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, this year has uh, has been so much fun, you know, bringing uh, the news and events uh, to folks, uh, to our listeners and uh, people who watch us on YouTube, etc., with uh, the both of you, Abhishek and Nirav, I could not have asked for a better company on a, on a weekend. Uh, it's been so much fun, really. And thank you so much uh, for being part of Bharat Varta. And, uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to all of the episodes that we're going to produce this year. Absolutely, Carrie. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure and an honor uh, to be, you know, called to contribute to this podcast. Fantastic. Uh, Avishek, Nirav, any final thoughts? I think we're we're probably at the 90-minute mark at this point. Uh, any final thoughts before we sign off? So, yeah, looking forward to more interesting discussions in 2023 whether on the weekly or on some specific episodes uh, there's always plenty to talk about in india and around the world so hoping for a great 2023 for our viewers as well awesome awesome uh shout out to our producer thiru as well who is uh you know, uh, who's the man behind the scenes, uh, does all of the hard work on uh, uh, the episodes that you see, single-handedly manages pretty much everything. Uh, so thanks, Thiru, for all of the amazing work. Thank you, folks, uh, for tuning in. This was a special episode where we looked back at 2022, all of the news and events. You know, Bharat Varta, we, uh, we produce uh, uh, episodes on politics, policy, and culture. We publish, I think, maybe two to three episodes uh, every week. If you liked this content, don't forget to share and subscribe. Uh, also, rate and review on all of your favorite platforms. It helps more people discover our content thank you again for keeping us company i'll see you soon on another episode with another amazing guest and a fantastic topic to talk about thank you guys